Welcome to First Fridays. Great to see so many of you here. I had shared with Bruce that when he presented a year, year and a half ago for this group, that a number of you requested that you'd like to hear some more Emily Dickinson. And so today is the opportunity to oblige. It's a privilege to introduce two long-term colleagues this afternoon. And each uh, spring, the Board of Trustees and the, the college recognize persons for their service. And you may or may not know that Carlene has been at McPherson College for 40 years, just completing her 40th years, having worked in just about every uh, facet of the institution. And we're really delighted to have her as Director of Alumni and Constituent Relationships. Bruce, I think you've been at McPherson for 32 32 years at this point. Another face that's had an opportunity to work in alumni uh, advancement, member of faculty, our chief academic officer uh, currently. Two extraordinary persons in their work with uh, students. So without further ado, we look forward to hearing more about Emily Dickinson and the Bell of Amherst. Welcome to Amherst. Uh, my, my name is Emily Elizabeth Dickinson. Elizabeth is for my Aunt Elizabeth Courier. She's father's sister. Oh, how the trees stand up straight when they hear Aunt Libby's little boots come thumping into Amherst. Here in Amherst, I'm known as Squire Edward Dickinson's half-cracked daughter. Well, I am. The neighbors can't figure it out. I don't cross my father's ground to any house or town. I haven't left the house in years. The soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. Why should I socialize with the village gossips? Oh, there goes one of them now, Henrietta Sweetser. Everyone knows Henny. Why, she'd intimidate the Antichrist. Look at her. She's strolling by the house, trying to catch a glimpse of me. Would you like that? So I give them something to talk about. I dress in white all year round, even in winter. Bridal white, Henny calls it. I guess people in small towns must have their local characters. And for Amherst, that's what I am. But do you know something? I enjoy the game. I've never said this to anyone before, but I'll tell you, I do it on purpose. The white dress, the seclusion, it's all deliberate. But my brother Austin, he knows. He says, Emily, stop your posing. But I do think sometimes that the stories about me distress him. But in a way, the stories are true. I mean, do you know what I'm saying? I, I believe in truth, but I think it can be slanted just a little. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies too bright. For our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. Ah, oh, words are my life. I look at words as if they were entities, sacred beings. There are words to which I lift my hat when I see them sitting on a page. Sometimes I write one, circumference, and I look at its outlines until it starts to glow brighter than any sapphire. I hesitate which word to take when I write a poem. A poet can choose but few words, and they have to be the chiefest words, the best words. A word is dead when it is said, some say. I say it just begins to live that day. Mm. 
Although a good many of them had been said decades earlier, Emily Dickinson's words didn't really begin to live for a significant audience until a day in November 1890 when a small white book appeared decorated with silver gilt Indian pipes containing 116 of her cryptic lyrics. Publishers had been reluctant to take a financial risk on the unorthodox, frequently puzzling poems. Roberts Brothers of Boston undertook the project only after uh, Dickinson's younger sister, Lavinia, agreed to cover printing costs. The poem seemed to a few readers the language of genius, to most others of eccentricity and poetic in ineptness. But unexpectedly, the book met with extravagant success. It went through 11 printings in less than a year, and the editors hastily compiled a second volume. Emily Dickinson, dead for five years, became the subject of widespread curiosity. She was indeed, as we have heard, the local character. When she died in 1886 at the age of 55, most who knew Emily Dickinson had not seen her face for a quarter of a century. Even the poet's physician, Dr. Bigelow, was expected to diagnose her final fatal kidney disorder by observing her fully dressed figure pass an open doorway, her face averted in the shadow. <laughs> Mabel Loomis Todd, one of the eventual editors of those first editions of Dickinson's poems, moved to Amherst in 1881, five years before Dickinson's death. A few months after she and her husband had settled into the home across the Dickinson Meadow, Todd wrote a letter to her parents. I must tell you about the character of Amherst. It's a lady whom the people call the myth. She is a sister of Mr. Dickinson and seems to be the climax of all the family oddity. She's not been outside of her house in 15 years, except once to see a new church when she crept out at night and viewed it by moonlight. No one calls upon her mother and sister ever sees her, but she allows little children once in a great while and one at a time to come in when she gives them a cake or candy or some nicety, for she is very fond of little ones. But more often, she lets down the sweet meat by a string out of a window to them. <laughs> she dresses wholly in white, and her mind is said to be perfectly wonderful. She writes finely, but no one ever sees her. Her sister, who was at Mrs. Dickinson's party, invited me to come and sing to her mother sometime. People tell me that the myth will hear every note. She will be near, but unseen. Isn't that like a book? So interesting. As it turned out, Mrs. Todd did play and sing regularly at the Dickinson piano, and she frequently corresponded with the poet for the years she lived as her neighbor. But Mabel Todd never met the intense woman who listened to her piano playing from the dusk above the stairs. She never set eyes on her face until she stared freely at it, white and bloated, in the casket in the Dickinson parlor. That experience, Mrs. Todd wrote, was beautiful and poetical. William Luce, playwright of the Bell of Amherst, has it just right, I think, when he has Emily tell us that her role as the myth of Amherst is deliberate performance. What remains obscure, what remains slanted, is the motive underlying the performance. Certainly, it goes beyond impish delight in tweaking the busybody village gossips. Feminist critics argue the role was Dickinson's strategy for securing the time and privacy she desired for composing her poetry. But Dickinson actually wrote less as she became more and more reclusive. I'm inclined to think her seclusion a means of carefully controlling the relationships she had with other people. Emily Dickinson, contrary to our stereotype of the recluse, did not shrink from human contact. She carried on a voluminous correspondence with over 100 friends and acquaintances. But her nature was exquisitely sensitive, passionately intense, and personal encounters so filled and stimulated her that she perforce had to check them. This is at least partly what Dickinson means when she says, 
as you will later hear, that every person is a poem. Language stimulated Dickinson as much, probably more, than per interpersonal encounters. But with words, her beloved philology, she could live, indeed live fully, despite her reclusion. My lexicon is my only companion, she wrote in 1862 to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, the literary critic who, along with Mrs. Todd, edited the first editions of her poems. From the beginning, Dickinson's thoughts were widely acknowledged as remarkable. The richness and detail of her appreciations of nature, the probity and frankness of her investigations of that possibility eternal life, the stunning heights and depths of meaning she found in suffering and pain, her intimate understanding of the many moods of love. But for modern readers, even more than the content or its representation, it is the language and not the ideas that is central to her art. The words remain. The words engage, startle, shock us, take us to the circumference of experience. They awake us again to language's ability to restore the childlike mystery to life. Time and again, a Dickinson poem makes the habitual, taken for granted, everyday experience seem brand new. And it is for this we cherish her today. Do you know that each one of you is, to me, a poem? You and you, each one a rare creation. And I suppose that's why I love you and you love me, even though we may not realize it. I discovered that secret a long time ago about the souls of people. And I thought that, that being a poem oneself precluded the writing of poems, but I saw my mistake. The poet lights the lamp and then goes out himself. But the light, it goes on and on. Essences are marked for, no, that's not the right word. Labeled, labeled, that's better. Essences are labeled for immortality. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life, the aching, or help one fainting robin unto its nest again, I shall not live in vain. People find it hard to believe that I had a normal childhood. They visualize instead a miniature version of me as I am now, a pint-sized little Emily dressed all in white, lisping riddles and aphorisms in baby talk. And of course, hiding from the family. Actually, at 15, I was a very typical Amherst girl. I went to dances, I giggled my way through classes, quilting bees, and scores of parties. I was trying very hard to believe that I was a ravishing beauty. I was infatuated with one dashing young man after another. Unfortunately, they didn't know it. Or if they did, they were smarter than I gave them credit for. Her Amherst neighbors called her the myth, the nun, the white moth of Amherst. But Emily herself coined the label that Luce takes for his title, the bell of Amherst. As the last scene suggests, the young Emily Dickinson was like many other New England debutantes, enjoying social gatherings and entertaining romantic fantasies. This is not to say that she was unexceptional, however. Her extraordinary ability with words was evident at a young age. Her teachers and peers recognized her precociousness, and she was infamous among her girlfriends for her sharp wit. She often spoke in puns and riddles, playing with language in such ways that, by her own admission, all men say, what, to me. <laughs> Likewise, she clearly exhibited a strongly independent, nonconformist streak. At age 17, Emily Dickinson resisted the considerable pressures of Miss Mary Lyon, 
headmistress of Mount Holyoke Female Seminary to profess Christ. At the end of the year, Emily was the last holdout, the only one of her class that Miss Lyon, whom uh, Dickinson referred to as the dragon, deemed without hope. But in her early years, at least, Dickinson loved society, entertaining party guests with piano pieces of her own composition, talking ideas with Amherst College faculty and other local intellectuals, sometimes staying so late at her brother Austin's house that her stern father would appear at the door at midnight to order her home. The experiences that led Emily Dickinson to leave behind the world beyond her father's gates and to select instead her solitary soul society remain the enduring mystery of Dickinson's life. In an April 1862 letter to Higginson, the poet obliquely referred to one possibility. I had a terror since September. I could tell to none, she wrote. And so I sing as the boy does by the burying ground, because I am afraid. Even Dickinson family members appear to have been left to guess at the submerged causes behind her retirement. The Amherst gossip was that Emily Dickinson had once been disappointed in love. Susan Dickinson, the poet's sister-in-law and most intimate uh, friend since youth, gave out after the 1890 publication of the poems that Emily had retired from society and thwarted passion for a married minister. Her sister Lavinia, Emily's lifelong daily companion, contradicted the legend of Emily's forbidden love. Emily Lavinia declared, simply, had to think, innocently implying the truth that it is imagination that enables the true artist to transcend social limits. Emily Dickinson's life continues to fascinate scholars who remain divided into sometimes contentious factions regarding the root causes of her reclusion. Thwarted romance remains a widely supported theory, but candidates for the mysterious figure Dickinson, sometimes referred to as master, remain numerous, including, among others, Benjamin Newton, Reverend Charles Wadsworth, Samuel Bowles, and Dr. J.G. Holland. Some scholars who find strong lesbian motifs in Dickinson's writing lean toward female candidates, such as Kate Anton or her sister-in-law, Sue. But other plausible explanations of her terror since September have been argued as well. As I mentioned earlier, feminists have taught us how strategic Dickinson's withdrawal was for her art, how the poet may have retired intentionally to create the time and space for writing. Psychoanalytic critics believe they have viable evidence of agoraphobia, and still others believe an ocular disease that threatened to take her sight in 1864 may have first manifested its symptoms a few years earlier, instilling fear of future blindness. But whatever explanation or explanations one favors, and the truth certainly involves a complex assortment of some or all of them, there is no doubt that some experience or combination of experiences inspired one of the most remarkable poetic outbursts in American literary history, that something caused Dickinson to begin at this time to sing as the boy does by the burying ground, loudly and without pause. Determining exact composition dates for poems uh, is problematic, but we can say with some certainty that Dickinson copied about 70 poems in 1860, about 80 poems in 1861, and then in a prodigious eruption about 380 poems in 1862, a rate of more than one per day. In 1863, production dropped to a more reasonable but still prolific 134 poems. By 1864, when her doctor forbade her to write for several months because of her eyes, production declined to only 27 poems. In all, Dickinson wrote about half of her lifetime poetic production and much of her most popular work between the ages of 27 and 32. Of the 1,789 exquisite lyrics she left in bureau drawers in her second story Amherst Bedroom at her death in May 1886, only 10 had been anonymously published during her lifetime. 
For Emily Dickinson, in fact, withdrew twice over, refusing to publish just as she refused to engage in public life. As her foremost biographer, Richard Sewell, has reminded us, readers of Dickinson today owe an irrepayable debt to Emily's sister, Vinnie. Emily once described her sister as the standard for superhuman effort erroneously applied. But without Lavinia's superhuman efforts to see the poems to posthumous publication, we would not be at all concerned with what Emily Dickinson was like. We wouldn't know she existed. It goes without saying that Emily Dickinson's withdrawal from the world included withdrawal from the organized church social institution that it is. Yet another vexing question about the poet's life concerns whether her rejection of the church embodied a more encompassing rejection of church doctrine. In this parlor, we always met for morning prayers as far back as childhood. Everyone in the family was religious except me. And they addressed an eclipse every morning whom they called our father. I can still hear my father say in a most militant way, I say unto you, it always gave me a chill. Why is religion made so grim, so dull? Why should we be made to feel so guilty? <laughs> sermons, sermons, sermons. I only heard one sermon that I really liked, and that was when the Reverend Dwight preached on unbelief. Sermons on unbelief always did attract me. <laughs> It was on a sweltering July Sabbath that I decided to stop attending church altogether. Well, I was old enough, I was almost 30. I came home very hot and faded, having witnessed a couple of baptisms, three admissions to church, a supper of the Lord, and some other minor transactions, including the sermon wheezed by Reverend Leland. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, and come before his presence with singing. <sighs> singing indeed. Poor Reverend Leland. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home with a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. I just wear my wings. And instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches, a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven, at last I'm going all along. In the name of the bee, and of the butterfly, and of the breeze. Amen. <clears throat> Emily Dickinson was the product of a stern, rural, Massachusetts Congregationalist home and village, with all the Calvinist overtones that that implies. It was Dickinson's New England contemporary, Herman Melville, who noted that there is a Calvinistic power of blackness from whose visitation no deeply thinking mind is always and wholly free. Emily Dickinson resisted the pressures of Miss Mary Lyon to profess publicly her doctrinal allegiance to the church. And the poems clearly relate that she did not indeed, could not, as Melville said, fully escape the Calvinistic power of blackness. Nevertheless, Emily Dickinson may have done as much as any product of her culture might be humanly expected to do, to transform the darkness of Calvinism to light. The familiar poem we just heard Emily recite, Some Keep the Sabbath, retains all the familiar trappings of the Christian church. She has a song leader, a sanctuary, a sexton, even a holy trinity, but all subverted to affirm the divinity of the natural order rather than its fallen status. Dickinson's linguistic debt to Calvinism extends far beyond terms shared among our common Protestant tradition. She subverted such distinctly Calvinist terms as covenant, election, seal, 
seed, sanctification, justification, saint, grace, and so on, for her own poetic purposes, to create her own unique poetic idiom. Lover of language that she was, Dickinson ultimately focused on the logocentrism of the Protestant tradition, transforming the theology of the word into a remarkable theory or theology of poetry. Dickinson speaks of the phosphorescence of words. By this she means that words, especially words shaped into poetry, possess a life of their own, that they embody and incarnate the divine creative power. As the God of Genesis spoke this world, this creation into being, the poet creates sensory experiences, entire worlds that explode in the minds of readers and hearers. She wrote to Higginson, when I feel as if the top of my head has been taken off, I know that's poetry. Is there any other way? For Dickinson, words possess the power of resurrection and eternal life, as we've already heard Emily say. A word is dead when it is said, some say. I say it just begins to live that day. Writing or reading poetry, that is to say the experience of poetry, is holy communion with the word that was in the beginning, the word that was with God, and the word that was God. In several poems explicitly, and in Dickinson's practice in general, language usurps Jesus as the word made flesh. Through language, the poet is the Logos, speaking the universe into being. Poetry is the power and glory of God on earth and the element of our private sacrament. In transforming Christian theology into a metaphoric theory of poetry, Emily Dickinson obviously transcended her Calvinist tradition which suspect, suspected poetry, or for that matter, anything other than the very plainest speech of deceptiveness and worldliness. The Puritans distrusted the same power of language that Dickinson celebrated. But in one fundamental way, Emily Dickinson was more Calvinist than her 19th century Congregationalist neighbors ever aspired to be. The constant message of the earliest Puritan preachers was this. In order to be sure of one's election or justification, one must be unsure. The surest earthly sign of sanctification was uncertainty about one's eternal predestined home. By such a criterion, Emily Dickinson was an unquestionable Puritan saint. Time and again, her works drive home the centrality of spiritual doubt, unbelief to the human condition. The black disk of despair will eclipse the source of all light, sometimes totally. God is hidden behind a veil, but that doubt does not preclude faith, either in God or in the resurrected Christ. What Dickinson shed in her withdrawal from organized religion was the heavy load of guilt and shame imposed upon doubt in the preceding two centuries of American congregationalism. Indeed, guilt, not doubt, was the blackness of Calvinism over which Melville despaired. Dickinson lived this Puritan paradox. For her, doubt was the essence of faith. For her, faith was the peerless bridge, P-I-E-R-L-E-S-S, -S, with the pun on peerless, P-E-E-R-L-E-S-S. -S. That is, her peerless or incomparable bridge of faith stood firm without peers, without visible or empirical means of support. The bridge of faith itself is too slender for the eye, yet it bears the soul as bold as it were rocked in steel with arms of steel at either side. Dickinson's bridge of faith joins behind the veil to what could we presume the bridge would cease to be to our far vacillating feet a first necessity? In other words, if we knew with absolute assurance of God's love and presence beyond the veil of unknowing, faith would not be faith, but a lower order of belief in that which could be empirically proved. 
Dickinson's poems of faith and doubt are among her most fascinating. And I'd love to share more of them with you, uh, but I already had a chance to do that at the session previously that uh, <laughs> Steve referred to. And anyway, it would be very inappropriate for me to claim the final word. When it comes to words, Dickinson takes all honors. And so we bring back Emily for a genuinely phosphorescent final word. It's all I have to bring today, this and my heart beside. This and my heart and all the fields and all the meadows wide. Be sure you count, should I forget, someone the sum could tell. This and my heart and all the bees which in the clover dwell. We'd be glad to take any questions or comments, observations that you have. What, what was the Jones? age that she was when she went when she decided this uh, to go into you know social? Oh, oh uh, uh, thirty. Yeah. yeah, she's born in eighteen. She's born in eighteen thirty, and in eighteen sixty, she she begins to um, yeah to become more reclusive. It's a gradual process. It doesn't happen all at once. Uh, for example, she did receive uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson as a guest. She and Higginson had been corresponding for um, almost, uh, almost 10 years uh, when Dickinson came to Amherst to visit her. And, uh, and he actually spent two days there. Uh, he said it was one of the most exhausting experiences of his life. <laughs> She absolutely just drained him of all of his energy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, she's just that intense. She was just that intense. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, that uh, uh, commentary on Calvinism that you are, uh, your uncertainty, ironically, is a sign that you are among the elect. Mm -hmm. I never come across that. Was that your uh, insight, or where did you come across that? Uh, uh, no, I mean, as uh, you know, during, during uh, graduate studies, working on my PhD in early American literature, uh, we read quite a bit of uh, early uh, Puritan uh, theology and early Puritan sermons, and 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 that's very clear. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. As a footnote, there's a counterpart in Japan. It's called Jodo Shinshu, and it's on Amida Buddhism. And you are almost certain that you're going to go to lead to heaven if you're uncertain. Yeah. So it's uh, exact parallel. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> that was exactly the idea. I mean, Puritans, of course, were very, very concerned about. I mean, it's predestined, and so life is all about trying to figure out: Am I one of the elect or am I not? And um, so you're you're always watching all of your neighbors to know whether they might be among the elect or not as well. <laughs> Uh, but there's there, but there's so much introspection and uh, and and yes that was for, for those early uh, the, the first couple of decades the the Puritans who were uh, in New England that uncertainty is the is, is the surest sign that you have that 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 humility if you will about your own election. You know. Did she write anything other than her poetry? Oh, well, voluminous correspondence, of course, yeah. Um, uh, lots of recipes. <laughs> um, no, no. There's, there's really no, no pro. Even her, even her correspondence is, is essentially uh, poetry. Uh, and, and in fact, a lot of Dickinson scholars have spent time going through the letters and, and, and separating it out uh, you know, into lined poetry. I don't mean to put Carlene on the spot. But you should. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you performed the Mill of Amherst uh, several different times, and uh, I'm sure each time you've come back to it, you probably see different insights the, into, the, into the character. And, and uh, what are some of the things that you perceive based upon the uh, characterization work that you have, have done in, in presenting this piece? Well, I, 
I think uh, one of the things is that I perceive her as not being um, afraid or, you know, frail. And in the opening of the actual show, she, you know, she like, comes in with her tea and then she like freezes, you know, because all these people are here <laughs> seeing her. And then she gets really scared. Um, but just for a short period of time. And, and, and I see that more and more as I come back to this. I, I see her being, you know, very strong, actually, even though she, you know, stayed away from people. That's probably why I see her as strong. <laughs> that was the time of the Civil War. Was she ever affected by anything on the outside like something as big as the Civil War? That's a really great question, Lois. Um, actually, in, in recent years, there have been a number of books written about Dickinson and the Civil War. She was, well, I mean, let's take, uh, again, uh, uh, Higginson is one of her most, uh, her, her best known correspondent. And I mean that not only in terms of just the fact that most, that a lot of people know that nowadays, but in his own time, Higginson was, was, was kind of a literary superstar in his own right. In fact, it was an article that he published in the Atlantic Monthly that prompted Dickinson to write him and send him a couple of her poems uh, to ask him if they might breathe or not. Um, but, but he was a, um, uh, he, he was a Civil War officer, he was a Union officer, in fact he was one of the officers of one of the U.S. colored troops, one of the very first U.S. colored troops that uh, fought in the Civil War. So she was very definitely, I mean she stayed very well informed, uh, but finding it in her work is, is really difficult. Um, Uh, it, it's, it, I mean, her life, her life is a life of the internal mind. I mean, that's just um, about the best way to sum it up. Um, she paid a lot of attention to what went on outside the house. Um, uh, some of her poems are prompted by the deaths of neighbors and, and so on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just beyond Amherst, it's hard to find evidence of any of that. But, but again, some scholars are working on that, and, and I think probably they, they take it a little too far, stretch it a little too much to find things there that may not be. And so much in-depth study, do you have your own opinion about what might have brought about her inclusiveness? Well, I, I, again, I think loose, uh, Pretty much, I mean, I think it was very deliberate. I don't think it was prompted by, um, you know, anything, for example, like the psychoanalytic critics say who see her having some kind of, you know, mental disorder, or agoraphobia, something like that. Um, the, the, the problem, and this, this was actually part of the subject of my dissertation, I mean, the, the, the problem with that theory that she withdrew partly to make room to write and be a poet um, is that after 1862, which is when she becomes more and more reclusive, she actually wrote less and less. So that that doesn't quite uh, that doesn't quite match up. Uh, but it finally comes down to the fact again that I just think that interpersonal reactions for her interpersonal interaction was just so incredibly intense and exhausting for her. There's something about her was just hypersensitive to people. Um, and it didn't take that personal contact for her to really connect with and to love and to love people. It, it, that was just too, too much for her to endure. <coughs> uh, we know that she definitely did have eye trouble. All right, uh, in 1864, uh, uh, one of her last trips out of Amherst, if not the last trip out of Amherst, was to go to Boston to uh, uh, an eye doctor. And uh, she was very concerned that she would never be able to read again. Um, but again, I don't think that had anything to do with her reclusiveness. Jean? Um, I don't know, it just kind of dawned on me a sense in the middle of 
all those discussion here, that uh, she strikes me in a sense as almost like a female monk out of the Middle Ages who goes into seclusion in order to kind of find his or her own, you know, uh, soul or framework, you know, where they're coming from, that sort of thing. Um, and a lot of the same motivations. And uh, she needed that time and space, perhaps, to do contemplation without a lot of um, daily, you know, all the daily interruptions and that sort of thing. Um, incubation space, in a way. And perhaps it was out of that that a lot of her poetry kind of came up. Put you out of that. Uh, well, I mean, what you're, what you're saying sounds a lot like what Lavinia always said about Emily. Uh, Lavinia, uh, who, who spent every single day uh, of her life together with her sister Emily, said she needed, she just needed time to think, right? I mean, she was that kind of a cerebral, uh, cognitive uh, oriented person. She just needed that time to, to think. And, and Dickinson's composing process uh, was was very much one in which uh, it was very spontaneous. Um, uh, she carried little scraps of paper. We know this pr primarily from her uh, nieces. Uh, there were two two nieces, the, the the Norcross girls, who would come and, and visit, had access to the house, and they talked about Aunt Emily you know, pulling out scraps of paper, uh, you know, out of her apron pockets, and suddenly on the windowsill, scribbling something down, and she'd stuff it back in her pocket. So. So just little words, lines as they occurred to her. Um, and, and then at night, she would uh, start working, putting things together. Um, that's you. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I mean, if that's going to be, if that is your, if that's, that's your priority, remaining open and available to that kind of spontaneous inspiration, then, then you do need to uh, be, you know, somewhat in a self-created bubble, right, to be free to do that. Thank you all for coming. Carlene and I appreciate it, and I appreciate Carlene so much. Thank you.